Something in progress. Hello and welcome to Thornley Bank Parish Church's service, Sunday service, for the 8th of October. Today we're going to continue in our theme that we started last week on the Beatitudes from Matthew chapter 5, although we're taking quite a different slant this week. But before that, let's worship the Lord. Let's sing, All I Once Held Dear. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that we can come here together 
to sit and worship you. You are God of light and truth, and you love us. We ask that you help us to love you more. We thank you for giving hearts and minds that can know you more. So help us to keep learning and discovering more about you each day, for all knowledge leads to you. Help us to be aware of you in our everyday lives and encourage us when life is difficult, when we're tempted to give up. For the times when we're unable to walk, to carry ourselves, lift us up, Lord, and carry us. Help us to learn more about your goodness and explore the world that you've created. And give us confidence that you offer us a real life that's full of adventure. Lord Jesus Christ, we're sorry for the wrong things that we do. Please forgive us and help us to forgive those who are unkind to us. You are great for you created our world and it is good. We thank you for the beauty of our world. Help us to live in such a way as to preserve your world, to keep it good. Thank you for our families and our friends, for all you send to love us. Please help us to be friends to others, to love others as you love us. And we make this prayer in your name, Jesus. And we're saying the words you taught us to say. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, Matthew 5, and this week I'm reading verses 1 to 10 of the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 1 to 10. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountains. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are, per blessed are, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And there's one of these Beatitudes I want to focus on today. But before that, let's sing again, Beauty for Brokenness. for brokenness hope for despair Lord in the suffering this is our prayer bread for the children justice joy peace sunrise to sunset your kingdom increase Shelter for fragile lives, cure for their ills, work for the craftsmen, trade for their skills, land for the dispossessed, rights for the weak, voices to plead the cause of those who can't speak. God of the poor. Friend of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, the tears fall like rain. Come change. 
exchange our love from a spark to a flame. Refuge from cruel wars, havens from fear, cities for sanctuary, freedoms to share. earth to green Christ for the bitterness His cross for the pain God of the poor Friend of the weak Give us compassion we pray Melt our cold hearts And tears fall like rain Come change our love from a spark to a flame Rest for the ravaged earth, oceans and streams Plundered and poisoned, a future and dreams Lord, and the madness, carelessness, greed us content with the things that we need. God of the poor, friend of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, the tears fall like rain. Come change our love from a spark. Until the nations learn of your ways Seek your salvation and bring you their praise God of the poor, friend of the weak Give us compassion verse that I want to focus on today is verse 3 of Matthew 5. Sorry, bless. Verse 4. I'm not counting very well. Verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. If there's one thing I have had to deal with, much more than ever before, is death since I became a minister. I see mourning families on a regular basis and I do my best to comfort them. And I hope that the words of the service that I deliver for the loved one who is gone contains words of comfort for those who are left behind. It's not something you hear preached about much, is it, death? And mourning. It's almost we're embarrassed by it. 
I don't want to talk about that. Well, that's difficult. But we have to talk about it, don't we? It's something everyone will experience. You know, the death of a loved one or the death of a friend. You know, it's somebody who is either very lonely, and that's terribly sad, or someone who, I don't know, somebody who can't deal with death, but doesn't go to funerals. But most of us will attend a funeral once, twice in our lives, maybe more. Blessed are those who mourn. I think sometimes sharing our thoughts and our experiences of death is a comfort to others. So the scripture is right. Blessed are those who mourn because they are blessed by the support, hopefully the love they receive through their grief. It's funny, we always think about the person who's died, oh, poor such and such, they passed away. Poor nothing. They're, they're, if they believed in God, if they believed, put their trust in Jesus, they're, they're beyond any suffering. They're in heaven, they're having a ball. It's us who are left behind, who are the ones who are poor. Blessed are those who mourn. <laughs> I'll never forget the day my grandmother died. I was 17, and she was the most important person in my life. She brought me up until I was six. And then I go back to Ga, as I called her. I called my grandmother Ga. It's a word from when I was an infant that I couldn't say gran, so I just said Ga, and that stuck. So Ga. I moved in with mum and dad when I was five or six, and I went back to Ga every weekend, up to the age of 12, 13. And when I became a teenager, up to the age of 17, when she died, Ga was always there. You know, always there with a, a warm word, a cup of tea, a club biscuit, Jacob's Club Biscuits. It's one of the wee things you fully remember. Ga died on the 5th of May, I still remember the date, uh, in 1975, Monday. I was off work. I'd taken a day off just for a day off, no reason. And I phoned her in the morning. I said, how are you doing, Ga? Fine, ah, she was just Ga, just normal. She went out for her shopping around lunchtime, came home and had a heart attack sitting in her chair in her living room. Thought, thought that she died early afternoon. The doctor said uh, that she wouldn't have felt much because the heart attack was that severe, it'd be like a, an instant thing. I remember wondering how the doctor could have known that. You know, I think he may have been trying to comfort us, but that was little comfort for me. All I knew was that Ga had died on her own without anyone with her. And with, for me, it was me who felt alone. The most important in my life, person in my life had gone. I remember how I heard the news. I'd been out playing football and I'd come in about half past nine that evening. I sat down. My dad said he had something really important to tell me, which wasn't that unusual because he always seemed to have something really important to say, like I should do more around the house or try and save some of my money instead of spending it or whatever. There was always something really important from my dad. He was a good man. And he guided me well, but yeah, at the age of 17, I think I knew best. I didn't, but that night was different, though. It was his mother who had died, and he knew how important she was to me. I heard his words, MG, he always called me MG. MG, God died this afternoon. I heard the words, but they didn't penetrate. And I carried it on as normal. I remember getting up from the living room and walking through to my bedroom and sitting on my bed and thinking, how am I meant to feel? Do I want to cry? No, no, I don't want to cry. How am I meant to do, what am I meant to do with this? And so I did nothing. I shut out, I shut out the stark reality that God had died. I didn't attend Guy's funeral. I was in denial that she was dead. And then I felt the guilt. 
Grief is so complicated. And for me and my family, our grief was filled with so much guilt. My dad was furious with, uh, at me for not attending the funeral. But I know really that he was angry with himself. You see, I visited Gar regularly, once a week, mostly. But when he was alive, sorry, when she was alive, Dad only saw her at Christmas or birthdays or New Year, six times a year. No, five times a year, because he wouldn't visit her on his own birthday. That was it. Christmas Day, my sister, my birthday, my mum's birthday, and New Year's Day. He would drive to the bottom of our stairs, live in a tenement, and he'd peep the horn for us to come down. He wouldn't come up. He was, he was angry at me. I was guilty for not going to the funeral. He was guilty at himself. I remember once when he was, he had to go at me once about not going to the funeral. And I said, big deal. You went to see her once she, di she died. I went to see her when she was alive. And he just shut up. There was so much guilt. Why am I telling you this? Well, I'm sharing my memories with you because I think in many ways our experience with grief can be similar. Many of us go through the same st stages of shock, denial, and guilt. And that's what I got hung up on. I got hung up at the, the denial stage. And I think it was the shock that put me into the denial. And then later came the guilt. First we say, oh, it couldn't happen. Then we say, it didn't happen. And then there's, if only I had, oh, why didn't I? We somehow feel responsible for everything. Some of us even imagine if we can all, only have done something, we could have changed everything, which is really true. But there's that if only feeling, isn't there? When an official in the White House died in 1917, an, ambition, an ambitious young man hurried to tell President Woodrow Wilson that he would like to take the deceased place. He was being over dramatic, this man. The president answered to take the wind out of his sails. You know, if only I could take Jimmy's place, I, you know, I would die instead of him. And Woodrow Wilson said, well, if it's all right with the under undertaker, it's all right with me. <laughs> That no one can take the place of someone in their death. We don't have to, because Jesus did it once and for all for all of us. No one can take the place of someone else in their life either. And when we experience a loss in our lives and we have to go on living, we experience every no, every emotion that we know through our grief, anger, love, fear. Oh, insecurity, abandonment, you name it. And we all feel our losses. They come in many different forms. They come as separation. For some, there's a grief in children leaving home. Moving house can bring about a sense of grief. Conflict, retirement, aging. Disappointment in life. All these are experiences in which we feel real grief, real grief. And all our strong emotions rise up in us and flow over us. Like the deep waters that Isaiah talks about going through. And we wonder. If we start crying, will we ever stop? We hold back our grief and hide because we imagine that once we really begin to feel it, we won't be able to bear our grief. Many people hide their grief for years. I didn't grieve my dad for 18 months after he died. I was angry for 18 months. And then I had an experience, which I think is a, was a spiritual experience, where I let the anger go. And the grief came in. And what a release that was. It was beautiful. Many people hide their grief for years. It gnaws away at them from the inside. 
And then comes the torrent of emotions. Two months, five months, 20 years later. Grief catches up with us eventually. And then we know that our loss could and did happen. And there was nothing we could do about it. I still grieve over Gan. She died in 1975. <laughs> There's a story about Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, and their brother Lazarus. The two sisters had sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was dying. But Jesus was busy and couldn't come immediately. And by the time he got there, Lazarus had died. As Jesus looked at these people, these people who were his friends and that he loved, he saw their suffering. Jesus felt the same things that you and I feel when someone we love dies. And Jesus wept. That's the time in the scripture where it says, and Jesus wept. People said, see how he loved them. And while others said, well, if he loved them so much, why didn't he get here and save him from his death? And that's a question we all ask at times. Why, if, why did God let that happen? If God loves us, why did he let a loved one happen? Did he die? Why didn't God act? Why didn't he get here sooner? Why wasn't our love enough to save this person? If only I'd known we say. Do we think that Jesus didn't know in this situation? Do we really think that the Lord didn't know that Lazarus was going to die? Not a sparrow falls without the Lord knowing it. He knows the numbers of our days and he's there. What happened in this case was Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That's why we've got the expression, oh, he came back like Lazarus. <laughs> God knows everything. Doesn't mean that things don't go wrong. And not that, Jesus, not that God or Jesus ever promised us it wouldn't. What was it God said? When you walk through the valley, valley of death, I will be there. I will comfort you with my staff. We weren't promised there wouldn't be death or, or tragedy. God didn't say evil won't affect you. The Lord has told us that there is evil. But he's also assured us that before it even happens, he's overcome it all. He's able to bring good out of it. He's there during and after and before. As you pass through the deep waters, I will be with you. And they shall not overwhelm you. For the person who's died, no matter what the cause, there's green mansions. There's wonderful meadows on the other side. So let's be clear that when we grieve at the death of someone, we grieve mainly for ourselves, for our own loss. Our loved ones are in a much better place than we are. They're with God in heaven. As we deal with our own pain, perhaps our anger and our sense of loss or guilt, maybe, as we really deal with it, and express it, we gradually begin to see that these things separate us from one another. They separate us from the one we loved just as much as death itself. We have to go through these feelings and come out on the other side before we can again be close to that person. As I said, I was angry for my dad at my dad for about 18 months. And then the forgiveness came. And I wonder who it came from. Did it come from me to him? Or did it come from Jesus to me? And then I was able to grieve. We have to go through these stages. We have to go through these deep waters. As you pass through the deep waters, I will be with you and they shall not overwhelm you. We have to go through these deep waters and let go of the anger before we can enter into a peaceful sense of grief. And after we've gone through the pain, the guilt and the anger, there's an awakening. There's a morning when we remember the good memories that bless us. 
and no longer cause pain. There's a morning when we can let go of all the bad feelings about death and know that life goes on. Morning, morning. Take out the you and you're left with morning, aren't you? There's a morning that the good memories flood back again into our lives, stronger and stronger, giving us the strength to go on. We can be close to that person again because we've let go of the negative stuff that was blocking out the goodness. The goodness that we cherished about that person's life. This is so important, but so often we've got a hard time doing it. Jesus promised that we'll be with him in heaven. He said, how can you not know when I've told you? I've prepared, prepared a place for you. And if it were not so, I would have told you that too. God's prepared. Jesus has prepared a place for us. It's there, waiting, reserved. For all our if-onlys, God says, I knew that too. And I can make all things work together for good. If only you let go of the onlys. If only you let go of. If only I'd done this, I'd done that. If only we'd given over the, the pain, the guilt and the anger and left it in God's hands. We must weep, because it's right that we express our grief. But then allow ourselves to be comforted. After my weeping for Ga, I realised that she never really left me. She's still with me in my heart. We'll not part with what we've kept. I remember... Couple of more, couple of times in my life when I look, I acknowledged God being there to myself, and it was after I graduated from from uni, and it was at my graduation, and I graduated from Edinburgh University with my Bachelor of Divinity at the age of forty nine, <laughs> and I walked up. You walk in Edinburgh University. It's in the McEwen Hall, which is a circular hall. And you come out your place and you walk down and you walk up a ramp. And then there's another ramp. And there's the professors all sitting on this dais. And as I got there, what they do in Edinburgh is they touch you on the, touch you on the head with a piece of black velvet, which is meant to come from John Knox's breeches. I'm not sure. It's a tradition. They doff, that's what they say, doff the cap, which means they plunk it on your head and take it off. And then they give you your diploma in a red uh, tube. And I remember as I received my diploma, I just looked up. I went, there you are, Gah. <laughs> and I knew that she'd be laughing. I knew she'd be smiling away. Oh, Mike. <laughs> we carry the memories with us. We carry the love in our hearts. Now, blessed are those who mourn. That special moment at my graduation when I was all too aware that God was looking down on me, cuffed to bits. Was I blessed by that? Or did it cause me pain? I was blessed. Of course I was. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who can rediscover the love that goes on, that we can live on. It's a love that enables us to live after grief. And one of the few good things about grief is that it teaches us how to treasure and cherish those that we love and the love we carry. If you've experienced grief recently or a while ago, I pray that the hollow in your heart with the pain dug in so deeply it's the same place where you now have room to receive and truly cherish much more joy and shared love. Those who have deeply grieved know the depth and heights to which love can go. And so it's my prayer for you. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, because they shall be comforted and their joy shall be full. 
Amen. God bless you. We close our time together singing a carry mind. Abide with me, of course. Abide with me. Hear the teaching of Jesus. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey. Go now to do God's will, and may the spirit and blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen. Take care of yourselves, and may God go with you all. God bless you.